Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a rather unfamiliar crowd, uh, but it's nice not to know 90% of the population in the audience rather than 10% as usual. Um, I hope I will tell you something about the spins today which might be useful. But um, for those who want to turn off right after the first slide, this is what I'm going to talk about. It's an ensemble of spins. They do not interact. And in some sense, you can make them paramagnetic or diamagnetic. And then they interact with light, and then this light probes a mechanical oscillator. So it's two quantum systems at a significant distance interacting with light at the quantum level. So one of those systems is a collection of spins, and it's a room temperature ensemble of atoms. They run at 200 meters per second, and they are contained in a glass container, which can be like a cubic inch, or it can be like here, three microns in cross section and a centimeter long. And the trick is that the inner walls of this vessel are coated with some alkane, alkene paraffin coating. And that means that the atoms can experience tens or hundreds of thousands of collisions without losing the quantum state of spin. So in this respect, you can kind of think of this cloud of atoms as a giant spin with whatever number of atoms you have there, depending on the size and the temperature, it can be 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 of those spins. And uh, because of this amazing property of this coating, you have pretty impressive T2 times for the decoherence of the magnetic state in the ground state. Depending on the size, essentially, of the vessel, it can be from milliseconds to seconds. Frequency of this oscillator can be tuned by the magnetic field. And uh, I will show you in a minute that this spin state can be initiated in its coherent state, or in other words, in the ground state of the spin noise. So we've been playing with those ensembles of atoms for quite a while, starting in 2001, we demonstrated the entanglement of two 10 to the 12 objects, 10 to the 12 atom objects at a meter distance. And uh, then we generated entanglement by dissipation, which we called forever entangled. And then what I'm going to talk about mostly today will be atoms mechanics interface, teleportation, and so on. So this should be familiar to most of, the, of you. The Bloch sphere, and as I said, those atoms can be seen as a large spin. And let's say that it has one classical projection. And then in the orthogonal plane, it's the quantum projection. And then from this commutation relation, if your state doesn't expand too far from a particular area on the Bloch sphere, then it's like a harmonic oscillator, holstein primakov approximation. You heard about it already this morning. So um, once again, the same thing. The projections of the spin on this axis and on this axis, when renormalized properly by the length of the spin, can be seen as x and p. So if you put all spins oriented, let's say, upwards, then you can think of it as a large collection of spin one-halves. So in this quantization axis, they're all in plus one-half state. Now, again, within holstein primakov approximation, you look here and you see that it's like X and P. And the point is that at room temperature, it's easy to initiate this spin in the ground state 
of the, of the noise, which essentially simply means that most of those spins are oriented in a particular direction, and you don't have coherences between the upper and lower state, because everything else essentially adds a little bit of thermal state here in the middle and doesn't make any difference. So what happens if you flip one spin and you don't know which one? You generate a superposition of one spin flip over all those 10 to the 8 spins, and that's essentially the Fox state in the spin space. And if you zoom into here, then you will see something like that as a Fox state. And um, as I said, it will be a large superposition where you don't know exactly which of the spins is flipped, but uh, you know that one of them is flipped. Now, if you put this system in the magnetic field, like that one collinear with the spin orientation, then the quantum projections of the spin will start oscillating around the z-axis. So now it becomes an oscillator with the uh, frequency equal to the Larmor frequency. And um, in this particular incarnation, I hope you believe me that it's an inverted oscillator. Because the first excited state clearly is a little bit closer to the South Pole because of this curvature of the planet. Therefore, the first excited state, as can also be seen here, has the energy below the ground state, which means that it's an inverted oscillator, which means that you can think of it formally as the oscillator with the effective negative mass. In reality, we play with cesium atoms, and uh, for the cesium atoms, the ground state uh, F is 4, and so we are talking about, for example, all atoms being optically pumped into MF4, and then the first excited state will be one split spin flip into MF3. This particular work where we tried to generate this kind of state is now in the archive, but it's not the subject of today's talk. The subject of today's talk is generation of entangled state of this microscopic spin and a mechanical object. So if we want to see what happens with light when it propagates through such a spin, this you've also heard a little bit about today. So you put this in the magnetic field. This is the system that I'm talking about, a small channel which you can see here, and atoms are flying around like that there, and uh, they don't decohere because of this special coating. And you put it in the magnetic field, and you send light through, and uh, in the atomic level picture, you can think of it as, for example, in this case, it's a positive mass oscillator, right? The first excited state is above the ground state. So if this is the polarization of the input light, then you can have Raman processes like that, or you can have Raman processes like this. Those fields are significantly detuned from the excited state, so it's purely dispersive interaction. And uh, you can write it down as the normal Hamiltonian, right? So in this case, you are creating an excitation, and you are creating a photon, so it will be like this. In this case, you are annihilating excitation and creating a photon, so it will be what we call a beam splitter interaction. And if this process and this process have the same amplitudes, then when you add them with the same amplitude, you will get the Hamiltonian that you've already seen today, actually, in the first tutorial, I believe. And uh, in different communities, this Hamiltonian is called different names. In our community, it's called the quantum non-demolition Hamiltonian because it includes the product of the quadrature operator of the spin and the quadrature operator of light. 
So those two operators, they are conserved because they commute with the Hamiltonian. And then the P operators can be measured because if you now apply this Hamiltonian to the P operator, for example, of light, you will see that the P operator of light is the P operator of light input, which is essentially describing shot noise, plus the readout of the X operator of the spins. So this is a quantum non-demolition readout of one projection of the atomic spin, which is also known in classical physics as the Faraday effect, right? You send linearly polarized light, and what you measure here in the polarization is the projection of the spin on the direction of propagation, which is one of the quadrature phase operators of the spin. And uh, once again, the same thing. So the spin oscillates, you can see it here. You measure in the laboratory frame the projection of the spin in this direction. So you make a polarization measurement like that. And what you get is an oscillating signal at the Larmor frequency. And the cosine and sine components of this give you the JZ and JY projections in the rotating frame. And if you remember the previous slide, those JZ and JY projections were analogous to the X and P operators of this effective spin. Now, it's been known since quite some time that in a system where one of the spins is classically oriented upwards and the other one downwards, that is to say, one of them is an effectively negative mass system and the other one effectively positive mass system. You can create an entanglement between those two spins. So if you guys have in the lab a solid state system of the spins and you can prepare one ensemble like that, the other one like this, and if your decoherence is low, and if you can provide the interaction with either microwave or light, you may think of generating an entangled state between those two objects by the measurement procedure. Because in this case, the well-known condition for the einstein podolsky rosen entanglement can be rewritten through the spin projections like that. And uh, essentially what it means is that you have two spin states, this one and that one. And the entanglement means that each of them is not very well known as a half of the entangled state. It's kind of in a thermal state. But they are all in a superposition of almost exactly anti-parallel situations. So, it's not surprising that such a system can be used, for example, for ultra-sensitive measurements of magnetic field, right? Because if you know that those two large vectors are exactly anti-parallel, and you expose one of them to a small perturbation, then you can measure this perturbation. And you can measure it in both X and P projections of the rotation. So you can measure amplitude and phase of the unknown perturbation. Yeah, so that's the thing, you know, you put this stuff inside some magnetic shield and that's what you get, it's a room temperature device. Now, now what this can be used for that we haven't used it for? It can be used to track the trajectory of motion of a mechanical oscillator beyond the Heisenberg uncertainty limit. And uh, forgive me for some uh, introductory slides, but um, the Heisenberg microscope was uh, allegedly developed at the institute where I worked. Heisenberg thought of his uncertainty principle in Copenhagen, apparently. So you have a particle, you want to see this particle, you scatter a photon from this particle, but the photon is a wave, and therefore, the better you focus it, the less 
you know the k vector, and so what happens now is that if you know the position, you don't know the momentum, and vice versa, we all know that. For an oscillator, this essentially means that if I measure in the laboratory frame my oscillator, then I make a measurement, and for example, at time t equals to zero, I measure the x component and I put the back action into P. I keep measuring. After a quarter of a period, I now measuring P and putting the back action into X. And the more I measure, the more I disturb my system. So this is referred to as the quantum back action of the measurement. And it can certainly be cast in the same fashion for the spin as for the mechanical motion. And yet, what I want to show you is that Arbitrary small perturbations in both position and momentum can be measured if you do the right measurement in the right reference frame. And as a reference frame for the measurement of motion, I will be using this rotating spin that I just told you about in the first 10 minutes. So we call it trajectories without quantum uncertainties. So quantum trajectories are usually not very well defined, classical are defined, so we want our quantum trajectories to be as defined as the classical ones. And we need three steps for that. So first, we define the trajectory with respect to a quantum reference frame. This quantum reference frame should have this effective negative mass, and you have to generate an entangled state of those two systems. And um, what happens then is the following. So we all know that it is possible to create a state where the difference of x's and the sum of p's is known with arbitrary accuracy because those two operators, this one and that one, commute. So let's look at the coordinate of our system of interest as a function of time with respect to our quantum origin, which we call the system naught. So it's the initial difference of the two coordinates plus the difference between the derivatives times time. No worries. And normally, this derivative is p and this derivative is p naught. And you have a difference here and a difference here. They still don't commute. So the simple EPR state doesn't help you. So what you need instead is obviously this sign. And this sign comes about if the reference frame system has a negative mass. Then the derivative of the coordinate is minus the momentum. And then your trajectory is defined by commuting variables. Everybody's happy. For an oscillator, you can think of it as a system with the negative mass, negative spring constant, and negative frequency. It's just, it's an inverted oscillator. And the most frequent question I get after this talk is, is it a stable oscillator? If it's an oscillator with the negative mass, shouldn't it like diverge? No, because it's just an inverted oscillator where the first excited state is lower. It's still a normal kind of stable oscillator. Well. I knew it will be an effect. So let me show you the optomechanical system that we're dealing with. Uh, you've heard some talks about optomechanics. Maybe you will hear more. But uh, here is our system. We have a membrane, a silicon nitride membrane between the two mirrors. And we send light into this resonator. And you make a measurement. So this is the resonance of this resonator. And if I send light which is blue detuned with respect to this resonator, then the moving membrane creates two sidebands. And in this picture, the red sideband is the advantageous guy. And this one is not generated. So what you have is generation of red photon which has lower energy, which means that a phonon should be born. 
So this is this kind of Hamiltonian. If you tune on the other end, it's this kind of Hamiltonian. And if you tune it smack in the middle, then it's again the quantum non-demolition Hamiltonian. So you see that the atom in a spin-oriented state, an ensemble of atoms in a spin-oriented state in the magnetic field, interacts with light with a Hamiltonian which is similar to the optomechanical Hamiltonian. That's nice. So this is our system. Uh, it's a relatively simple fridge. Um, we have six Kelvin temperature, which for most of you, I suppose, is just as well as room temperature. And uh, there is a lot of nice optical axis. And we use a membrane in this experiment with uh, 20 million Q. And uh, we thought that it was a lot. And now we have the membrane with the Q approaching a billion, 10 to the 9. It's really amazing devices. So it's a silicon nitride thing, about 100 uh, nanometers thick, millimeter by millimeter, which is embedded into the phononic band gap structure. And this buys us 20 million Q. And uh, this is in the last seven, eight, nine minutes, what we have done so far. So we have this mechanical oscillator and we have the magnetic oscillator. So if it would be like that, then it will be a normal positive mass oscillator. All we need to do is to change the direction of the magnetic field. And then we have a negative mass oscillator. So it's this same system with the artist's view. There is this little atomic ensemble in some nice magnetic shield. Light goes through, interacts with the membrane placed between the two mirrors. The finesse of this resonator is about 3,000. So that's the atomic system. You have seen it before. And this is our membrane. So this is the one used in this paper. And this is the next generation with the Q approaching a billion. It's not an easy experiment because those two oscillators, they have very different properties. And I don't think I have time to discuss it. But it suffices to say that the mechanical oscillator with its amazing Q still is in the thermal environment at 6 Kelvin. There is half a million of phonons. So we need to do cooling of it, and we do it optomechanically. The spin oscillator, on the other hand, as I mentioned to you, is almost in the ground state, but it's broader. So you still, you, you need to match those two responses, and you can do it. Again, about matching the responses for the atoms, the optical depth and resonance is the name of the game. It's essentially the cooperativity. And for the optomechanics, this is the known cooperativity equation. So, what I wanted to show you is that we can cancel the quantum back action of the measurement when we do the joint measurement on the two systems. Because if I can cancel the quantum back action, then I can measure the relative motion of the two systems with arbitrary accuracy. And I can create an entangled state. So first of all, I show you that indeed we can observe the quantum back action and almost the ground state noise for the spins. So what you see here is probing this atomic ensemble with linearly polarized light. And we can do it with the ground state noise in the orthogonal state that is vacuum noise or we can add a little calibrated noise. And by doing some rather simple calibration, we can say that at a resonance frequency, which is the Zeeman frequency, this curve corresponds to the intrinsic noise of the spin, this intrinsic noise, which is very close to the ground state noise. And this area corresponds to the quantum back action 
imposed by the vacuum fluctuations of light. So this is good news. We see this quantum back action, so there is something to play with. The same thing we observe for the mechanical oscillator. Here, the yellow thing is the quantum noise of just maybe two and a half thermal quanta. We are also very close to the ground state. And the red area is the quantum back action of light. So for those two systems, we can observe the quantum back action of light. Let's now put them together. And when we put them together, we see the following. So we send light through the atoms, through the mechanics, and then make, it, make a homodyne measurement. So this is the spin off, no atoms. What you see here at the frequency corresponding to the drum motion of the membrane, you see the thermal noise of the membrane, which is this light curve and the total noise, which is the blue curve, and the gray area is the quantum back action of the measurement. And now we add the atoms. So, first of all, great news is that the overall noise goes down. So this is the overall noise of the membrane only, and the red one is the hybrid. So you add another quantum system, and you reduce the noise. Albeit, the atoms, they also have their own noise, right? So the thermal joint noise, which is the thermal noise of the membrane, close to the ground state, but still, plus the thermal noise of the spins is greater than just the thermal. And the overall is smaller. So that means that the quantum back action is significantly reduced. What's significant? Significant is 30%. Limited by losses, Work in progress definitely can be done better, but demonstrated that it works. So those are the heroes. Uh, Rodrigo is actually here in the room, I hope, and uh, his poster was presented this afternoon, and some of you have seen talking to him. And Georgos and Christopher made this happen. In the last three minutes, how can this principle be used for a rather unusual application, and that is the gravitational wave interferometry? So you may argue that the Nobel Prize has already been given for that, therefore nobody wants to work on it, but we are generous, we agreed to work on it. So the gravitational wave interferometer is a four kilometer interferometer, light comes in, reflects, comes in, reflects. If there is nothing, then here is zero. If the gravitational wave comes, it's a quadrupole wave. So it does the displacement in the out of phase. And so you have a signal here, and this is what they got the prize for. So it's the unbalanced signal here. When they reach their next uh, milestone of sensitivity, hopefully in a few months, they will be limited by the quantum back action of the measurement. They have hundreds of kilowatts of light circulating here, and the kilogram mirrors are bombarded by the radiation pressure of those hundreds of kilowatts, and this is what limits their sensitivity. So what we think we can do is to add a little breadboard with our nice atomic ensemble and do the back action cancellation in the similar fashion that we have done in the lab for the nanomembrane. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my wonderful collaborator, Farid Khalili. And if you are interested in more details of how this is done on paper, <laughs> admittedly, this is the archive work. Right. This is what we show in this work that as a function of frequency, this is the sensitivity of the LIGA gravitational wave observer. This is the current sensitivity, and uh, it's limited by the short noise of light for high frequencies and quantum back action for low frequencies. 
And if our atoms work as they should, we should expect broad range reduction of the quantum noise of this system. And with this, I thank you for your attention.